feeling so good to be with you all this morning. Whether you're watching us on Facebook Live or YouTube or Church Online, we are so honoured to have you with us this morning. So you are so welcome. Yeah, and if you're watching on Church Online, why don't you say hello? Just give us a wee um, hi, good morning or whatever on there. And, and maybe if you're on Facebook or YouTube, uh, you would consider um, hitting the link to Church Online and joining us there today um, so you can join in with some of the, the, the conversation uh, on our chat there. One of the things that really encourages Lorraine and I um, on a Sunday is just that simple hello when your name pops up um, and we just find that really, really encouraging. Um, it just makes us happy, doesn't it? it just, honestly, we just feel so happy when we see a, the name pop up and we're thinking, oh, it's so good that person's with us. So yeah. if that's if you've not said hello yet this morning, why don't you do that? If you're on Church Online, say hi. If you're on Facebook or YouTube, nip over to Church Online using the link and say hi and m m make us happy. <laughs> Cheer us up. It's all good. Also, um, at the end of this part of our service, at the end of the recorded part of our service, we will be going over to Zoom um, and then we can um, engage with each other in real time. We've really enjoyed those times these past few weeks. Um, uh, just the conversation, seeing your faces, um, praying together, um, just waiting on God in real time. Um, if, if that's a right thing to say. But, you know, but it's just so good doing that together all at once at the same time. So there'll be an opportunity to uh, join us on Zoom towards the end of this recorded part of our service. Fantastic. But right back to the here and now, we have Kenny going to speak to us this morning. And Kenny is such a gifted um, teacher of the Bible. He's very knowledgeable and he's got a great way of communicating what God wants to say to us. Um, so this morning, um, it's just an honour and a privilege to have him speak. So let's hear what God has got to say to us through Kenny this morning. Over to you, Kenny. Good morning. Psalm 132 is the 13th Song of Ascent out of 15. So that means that we are nearly at the end of our journey. And just to remind us, these psalms were used by pilgrims as they would make their journey from their house to the house of God. Every year they would travel to the temple in Jerusalem for festivals of worship. And they would sing these songs on the way to remind themselves of the God they worshipped and their place in the long story of his relationship with his people. And Psalm 32 would probably be sung as they entered the city of Jerusalem and laid eyes on the temple itself. And the temple was called the house of God, and it represented God's presence among his people. For them, this was the place where heaven and earth met. And as they sang this psalm, Psalm 132, their minds would fill with the struggle of Israel to have a place where they could permanently dwell with God. Have you ever had a desire for a permanent home? Sandra and I got married when uh, I was living in America and we lived there for 10 years. And when God told us to move back to Scotland, it involved um, a, a period of us being apart. Because um, I had to move first so that I could get a job in Scotland because without one, Sandra couldn't get a visa to live here. So we spent six and a half weeks apart, me in Scotland living in a bedroom in my mum's house um, and Sandra in the States living with our kids in her parents' house. Um, before too long, I got a flat for us here and I filled the flat with furniture and I set up all the rooms and I unpacked all of our stuff. So I had a house. But it wasn't a home because they weren't there with me. I missed their presence and we did the best we could. We would have daily video calls and text messages and those were really sweet times and it helped us to stay connected. I actually remember video calling Sandra from a furniture shop so we could actually shop together and I could show her all the stuff I was looking at. But thankfully, eventually Sandra came over for a visit with the kids. And during that visit, I actually got a job, and so it was time to finalise Sandra's visa application. But to do that, 
she had to go back to the States. So we were separated again for another three weeks, I think. But eventually her visa was approved and she moved back over here permanently. And the house now became a home. It wasn't about the building we were in, but it was about the fact that we were in it together. It was about presence and permanence. We were together for good. And Psalm 132 talks about King David and his son, son King Solomon, who were both passionate about God's presence. They wanted to honour God by building a permanent temple for him, a place where he and his people could be together for good. Psalm 132 talks about their attempts to build this temple and it also shows us God's response. But before we read the psalm, I want to give you a little bit of the David and Solomon backstory so you've got some context for it. David became king of Israel at a national low point and he led them in victorious battle over their enemies. He conquered Jerusalem from the Canaanites and then he went to a place called Jar to retrieve the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark had been stolen by the Philistines years before and it was, a, it was symbolic of God's presence and rulership over Israel. And so to have lost it to their enemies was a terrible failure. They longed to get it back and with it to get back God's blessing over them. So David went to a lot of trouble to retrieve it and bring it back up to Jerusalem. And he had pitched a tent there, which was to be a place of worship. And he put the Ark of the Covenant, God's, the symbol of God's presence, in the tent. So God's presence and blessing had been restored to God's people. But David was troubled because he lived in a palace made of fine cedar wood. And the symbol of God's presence was outside in a tent. So he vowed that he was going to honour God by building a temple, a house for God to live in. But God responded to him like this in First Chronicles 17 verse 4. It says, God says to him, you're not the one to build a house for me to live in. I've never lived in a house from the day I brought the Israelites out of Egypt until this very day. My home has always been a tent moving from one place to another in a tabernacle. Yet, no matter where I've gone with the Israelites, I've never once complained to Israel's leaders, the shepherds of my people. I've never asked them, why haven't you built me a beautiful cedar house? Furthermore, I declare that the Lord will build a house for you, a dynasty of kings. For when you die and join your ancestors, I will raise up one of your descendants, one of your sons, and I will make his kingdom strong. He is the one who will build a house, a temple for me, and I will secure his throne forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. I will never take my favor from him as I took it from the one who ruled before you. I will confirm him as a king over my house and my kingdom for all time, and his throne will be secure forever. So God wasn't going to let David build him a house. Instead, God said he would raise up one of David's sons who would build a house for the Lord, a permanent temple for God. This descendant would then rule forever over God's people. Well, next in line to David was Solomon, who fulfilled his father's desire to build an extremely beautiful and ornate temple to honour God. And Solomon had the Ark of the Covenant, the symbol of God's presence, placed in the heart of the temple. And a large curtain was put in place to separate the place where the Ark was from the rest of the temple. Where the Ark was, behind this curtain, was the Holy of Holies, the place where God's presence rested. And Solomon then gathered all the people together to dedicate the temple. And in front of them all, he said this, my father David wanted to build this temple to honour the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. But the Lord told him, you wanted to build the temple to honour my name. Your intention is good, but you are not the one to do it. One of your own sons will build the temple to honour me. And now the Lord has fulfilled the promise he made, for I have become king in my father's place. And now I sit on the throne of Israel, just as the Lord promised. I have built this temple to honour the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. There I have placed the ark which contains the covenant that the Lord made with the people of Israel. And now, O Lord, God of Israel, carry out the additional promise you made to your servant David, my father. 
For you said to him, if your descendants guard their behavior and faithfully follow my law as you have done, one of them will always sit on the throne of Israel. Now, O Lord, God of Israel, fulfill this promise to your servant, David. But even as Solomon is praying, he realizes that God can't be contained in a temple. But in spite of this, he prays that God will always meet with his people in the temple that the king has constructed. Verse 18, it says, Will God really live on earth among people? This is Solomon talking. Why, even the highest heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple I've built. Nevertheless, listen to my prayer and my plea, O Lord my God. Hear the cry and the prayer that your servant is making to you. May you watch over this temple day and night, this place where you have said you put your name. May you always hear the prayers that I make toward this place. May you hear the humble and earnest requests from me and your people Israel when we pray towards this place. Yes, hear us from heaven where you live. And when you hear, forgive. And now arise, O Lord, and enter your resting place, along with the ark, the symbol of your power. May your priests, O Lord God, be clothed with salvation. May your loyal servants rejoice in your goodness. O Lord God, do not reject the king you've anointed. Remember your unfailing love for your servant, David. So Solomon's desire is that the temple will be a place where heaven and earth meet where sins are forgiven and where God's presence is known and experienced. After his prayer, the presence of God fills the temple like a fire and the people are overwhelmed and they begin to worship. It's an amazing moment of God's presence moving in with his people. Now, many scholars think that Psalm 132, our psalm for today, was written to commemorate this moment when Solomon dedicated the temple. It's by far the longest song of ascent, and it's really in two parts. The first part is from Solomon's perspective, his prayer to God. And the second part is from God's perspective and his promise to David. When the pilgrims would sing this as they entered Jerusalem, the backstory that we just spoke about would flood their minds. And hopefully you'll have a similar experience as we read it. Psalm 132. Lord, remember David and all that he suffered. He made a solemn promise to the Lord. He vowed to the mighty one of Israel. I will not go home. I will not let myself rest. I will not let my eyes sleep, nor close my eyelids in slumber until I find a place to build a house for the Lord, a sanctuary for the mighty one of Israel. We heard that the ark was in Ephratha. Then we find it in the distant countryside of Jar, Let us go to the sanctuary of the Lord. Let us worship at the footstool of his throne. Arise, O Lord, and enter your resting place, along with the ark, the symbol of your power. May your priests be clothed in godliness. May your loyal servants sing for joy. For the sake of your servant David, do not reject the king you have anointed. And now here's the response from God's side. The Lord swore an oath to David with a promise he will never take back. I will place one of your descendants on your throne. If your descendants obey the terms of my covenant and the laws that I teach them, then your royal line will continue forever and ever. For the Lord has chosen Jerusalem. He has desired it for his home. This is my resting place forever, he said. I will live here, for this is the home I desired. I will bless this city and make it prosperous. I will satisfy satisfy its poor with food. I will clothe its priests with godliness. Its faithful servants will sing for joy. Here I will increase the power of David. My anointed one will be a light for my people. I will clothe his enemies with shame, but he will be a glorious king. Psalm 132 tells of David and Solomon's desire to build God a permanent home and God's promise that one of David's sons would be the one to build a permanent place on earth for God to dwell. Now, the pilgrims, as they're singing this, they'll be well aware of this story, but they'd also be aware of what happened next. Solomon did not remain faithful to the Lord, and neither did the vast majority of the kings who followed him. As a consequence, the nation of Israel went through many wars, divisions, and defeats. They were eventually captured, uh, conquered by the, the, the Babylonians, taken into captivity, Solomon's temple was destroyed, the Ark of the Covenant was stolen again, this time lost for good, and the Davidic monarchy was overthrown. 
Eventually, the Jews were allowed to return to the land, but always under the rule and control of other empires like Babylon, Greece and Rome. They also rebuilt the temple, but it was a mere shadow of Solomon's temple and God's presence never did return to it. Human efforts to build and maintain a house for God failed miserably. Now, God had promised David that his son, one of his descendants, would build a permanent temple where God and his people could dwell together. But now Israel was ruled by the kings of other nations, and the original temple had been destroyed and was replaced by an inferior temple. How was, going to, how was God going to fulfill this promise. Well, many years later, a descendant of David named Jesus would enter this temple at the time of a great festival. He became incensed because there were traders um, in the, the outer court who were exploiting those who needed sacrifices and blocking people from praying in the temple court. He made a whip and he began driving them out yelling this, Get these things out of here. This is from John 2. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. Then his disciples remembered this prophecy from the scripture. Passion for God's house will consume me. That scripture is a psalm of David. Just like David, Jesus had an overwhelming passion for God's dwelling place. And this caused some consternation among the Jewish leaders. And so they confronted him. In John 2, it continues... The Jewish leaders demanded, what are you doing? If God gave you authority to do this, show us a miraculous sign to prove it. All right, Jesus replied, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. What, they exclaimed, it's taken 46 years to build this temple and you can rebuild it in three days? But when Jesus hit the temple, he meant his own body. In a mysterious way, Jesus was saying that he was now the temple, the place where heaven and earth meet, the place where God dwells among his people. The old temple had been destroyed by sin and rebellion against God. That same rebellion and sin was going to lead to Jesus being killed. But he would be raised up again. He would replace the temple building as the permanent place where God and people could meet. So it was now through Jesus that people could come into relationship with God, worship him, and experience his presence. This was a temple that couldn't be destroyed. It's permanent. Jesus is God with us, Emmanuel. And Jesus goes on to state this pretty explicitly in other conversations with the Pharisees. In Matthew 12, verse 6, he says, I tell you, there's no one here who, uh, sorry, say that again. I tell you, there is one here who is even greater than the temple. And again, later on in that same chapter, he says, now someone greater than Solomon is here, but you refuse to listen. What was Solomon remembered for? Building the temple. And Jesus says that he is a greater king than Solomon because he provides the greater temple himself. Jesus would also do things outside the temple that ordinarily were reserved for for the temple itself. Things like, forgiving sins. So in Matthew chapter 9, we read this, Jesus climbed into a boat and went back across the lake to his own town. Some people brought to him a paralyzed man on a mat. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, be encouraged my child, your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of religious law said to themselves, that's blasphemy. Does he think he's God? They were so angry because you had to regularly go to the temple to make a sacrifice to receive forgiveness from God. They literally had God in a box and you had to go there to sacrifice to him. But here is Jesus out in the street and he's forgiving people of their sins. Jesus had replaced the temple as the place you went to to receive forgiveness. And Jesus would bring this forgiveness to its completion when he gave himself on the cross as the once and for all substitutionary sacrifice to atone for sin. In fact, Jesus' statements about the temple are in part the reason that he was eventually unfairly convicted and sentenced to death. At his trial, we read this in Matthew 26. Inside, the leading priests and the entire high council were trying to find witnesses who would lie about Jesus so they could put him to death. 
But even though they found many who agreed to give false witness, they could not use anyone's testimony. Finally, two men came forward who declared, This man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Well, aren't you going to answer these charges? What do you have to say for yourself? But Jesus remained silent. Then the high priest said to him, I demand in the name of the living God, tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Remember, Messiah means anointed one of God, and it was used to describe this long-awaited descendant of David who was going to rescue Israel. So they ask, are you the Messiah? And Jesus replies, you have said it. Jesus was the descendant of David. He was the king who would permanently establish God's dwelling place on earth. And what's more, Jesus was that place. As Jesus breathed his last breath on the cross, we read this in Matthew 27. Then Jesus shouted out again and he released his spirit. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Do you remember that the curtain was put there to separate off the holy place of God's presence? At Jesus' death, that curtain is ripped apart. And from that moment on, you no longer had to go to the temple to experience God's presence. God did not live in a house built by, by men. His presence had now left the temple and become available to all who trust in Jesus. Then Jesus rose from the dead and he is now the permanent place of meeting between God and men. He is the one who unites humanity and God. He is the point where heaven and earth meet. We no longer need to make pilgrimages to Jerusalem to meet with God. Everyone, everywhere, can now meet with God through Jesus Christ. In fact, when we put our faith in Jesus, he fills each person with the Holy Spirit, God's personal presence with us. The first instance of this is on the day of Pentecost. The disciples were gathered in a room and as they were praying, the Holy Spirit rushed into the room and they were overwhelmed with his presence. And the scriptures say that the Spirit appears as flames above the heads of the disciples. Does all of this rushing and fire and overwhelming presence of God remind you of anything? Yeah, the moment when God's presence entered Solomon's temple. So what's happening here? God has left the temple and he's now entered the hearts and the lives of those who trust in Jesus. And Paul talks about this explicitly in his letters. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God has bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. Each one of us who's put our faith in Jesus has been fill with the Holy Spirit. He dwells within us. And Paul says that this ought to affect the way that you live. We must use our bodies to honour God. But it's not just about us as individuals. Paul also says that it's in our unity together as the church that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 3, Paul writes this, don't you realise that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? Do you see that? Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? And then Ephesians, Paul reminds them that this, this isn't just for the Jewish people, but for all people. In Ephesians chapter 2, he says, Together we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling place where God lives by his spirit. Through the church, Jesus is fulfilling God's promise to David of a permanent place where heaven and earth meet and where God dwells with humans. The temple that Solomon built was a mere shadow of the glory that was to come. God doesn't dwell in a building made with human hands. Through his son Jesus, the presence of God now extends to all people of all nations, in all times, and all places. And when we trust in Jesus, 
Our lives are caught up in the promises of God to make his home with us. You are a part of that promise. And all of this makes me think of our present situation. It's very easy for us to put our hopes in being able to be together in a building to worship God. And believe me, I've cried tears over my desire for the day to come when we can do that again. But, and it's going to sound a bit cliche, but if we've learned anything today, it's that God doesn't dwell in a building. He dwells in us individually and he dwells in us corporately. So this means two things for us, I think, at least. Number one, you can experience God's presence wherever you are. Through the word, through prayer, through worship, through serving others, through connection with other believers, you can become aware of the presence of the Lord right there with you. Your accessibility to God is not on pause until in-person church gatherings open again. I want to encourage you and myself to take hold of this gift of God's presence that he's given each of us. The Holy Spirit dwells within you. You can every day pursue and experience God's presence. He's not afar off. He's not in a building somewhere. He is in you. You can hear his voice, be guided by him, experience his comfort and love and be close to him. He dwells with you. The second thing I think that this tells us is that God's presence is amplified when we join together as his people. First Corinthians says that it's all of us together that are the temple of the Holy Spirit. A brick can be pretty sturdy on its own, but when it's joined together with other bricks, cemented together, it becomes something greater. That's why the New Testament is full of pictures and instructions to persist in being together as God's people. Read your Bibles. God has called a people to himself and it's among his people that he wants to dwell. Many times in the scriptures, God says, I will be their God and I will dwell among them. That has looked different at different times of church history and it certainly looks different right now. We are wrestling with the idea of how to be together although we are physically apart. Each of us are having to make choices to engage in ways that aren't familiar or aren't the way that we would necessarily like it. Our belief in God's presence is being pushed beyond the usual parameters. But I want to ask you these questions. Can we know God's presence among his people in an online service like this? Can we become present with each other through God's presence with us? Can the Holy Spirit unite us together, even though we're all in our own homes? Can the Holy Spirit work in an after-service Zoom call, or Bible study, or small group, or prayer time, even though we're engaging through a device? Our answers to these kinds of questions will determine how we engage with God and with each other in this time. Yes, we are waiting and longing for a return to in-person gatherings. But I don't think that pressing pause and disengaging from each other is God's desire for us. I believe that right now, being present with God and with each other, however that looks, is not only possible, but is vitally important. As Paul says, we are becoming a holy temple for the Lord. And my prayer for us is that we can see past the limitations and put our hope in the possibilities that arise when we trust in this truth. God has made his dwelling place among his people, both now and forever. Let's pray. Lord, will you, um, will you drive home to our hearts this reality that you are dwelling within us as individuals and that you're dwelling within us as a people? Will you help us to receive the gift of your presence in us and to give and receive the, the gift of our presence with each other? Will you help us in these difficult times to persist in meeting together, in encouraging one another, in spurring one another on 
to good works in reminding each other that you are the God who can be trusted. You have a way. You will deliver us. You will sort this out. And one day we will. We'll cross over that thresh line into a place where we're gathered together. But right now, Lord, help us to see that we are together in a very unusual way, but we are together because of your presence in us and with us. So today, this morning, we worship you as we sing, as we call out to you, as we pray. Lord, um, bless us. Bless each of our households with your, with your presence and bless us as your people with your presence and remind us that you are dwelling among us that you are at work and that you have so much more way beyond we can even imagine that you want to do and accomplish and bless us with in the future and in this moment we trust in you and we know that you are right here with us amen
Thanks guys, that was a really great time together this morning. Maybe today God has been speaking to you and you're watching today and you have never said yes to Jesus. Maybe you've never given your life to him. Maybe you've never committed to living for him for the rest of your life. And what I would like to do just now is give you an opportunity um, to pray to God and ask Jesus to come into your life and give you new life um, in a way that you've never experienced before. We believe that um, God his God's heart is for you to know him. He's pursuing you. He wants to be in a relationship with you. And if you've never um, taken that step towards connecting with God in that way, then I want to give you that opportunity to do that right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray a prayer. Um, and in each line, I'm going to leave a space so that you can repeat the line that I've just said. And effectively, what that's going to mean is, it, is that the prayer that I pray pray then becomes your prayer okay so why don't we do that right now okay so we're we ready let's let's pray father god thank you for speaking to me today thank you for being interested in my life i am so glad that you want to know me And I thank you that you love me enough to send your son to die for me so that I can live. I admit that I have done wrong things in my life. And I have been living separate from you. I have neither acknowledged you nor included you in my life. So today I want that to change. Today I want to know you. Today I want you to forgive me and to save me. And I want to live for you for the rest of my life. Thank you, God, for hearing me. Thank you for receiving me and bringing me into your family and giving me new life. Amen. Amen. If you pray that prayer, we would love to hear from you. And you can do that in a, a number of ways. Um, you can contact us at info at falkertvineyard.com um, or you can contact us through our website or on social media. We would love to hear from you and share in the joy and the happiness of your new life in Jesus. So if you've done that today, welcome to the family. Welcome to the Church of Jesus Christ. You are loved and you are welcome um, to be with us. Okay. okay, more announcements. We are, we've always have been a generous church and we want to continue being generous. Um, so we, as part of our worship this morning, if you um, want to give financially to the church, then you can do that by going to fogartvineyard.com forward slash give. And we, yeah. Good, well yeah. done forward slash give. Um, tonight we are calling the church to prayer. Um, so at 8pm we will be on Zoom uh, praying together and we want to see the, the Spirit of God move in our town and move in our nation in a mighty way. And if we're going to see that happen we need to pray. We need to pray individually but we also need to pray together. So um, if you want to um, join in with us tonight in prayer, if you go to falkertvineyard.com forward slash what's on, you will see um, the um, info about our prayer meeting tonight and a link to Zoom where you can join us at 8pm this evening. And also on Thursday nights we have a Bible study studying the Torah 
Um, and that has been so well received, doesn't it? Yeah, it's been yeah, people, we've popular. had so many good um, uh, conversations come but out of that. So if you would like to get involved in that, then you can do that also by going to fogabinyard.com forward slash what's on and you can sign up there. Yeah, yeah well done. It's a treat. <laughs> Um, now, also, um, some of you may have done this already today, but we always have a kids video um, running each Sunday. And, and Rachel and our kids team have been doing an amazing job with this over uh, the past six mm -hmm. months. So if you've got uh, children in, in your, your house and you haven't watched that video yet, or maybe you want to watch it again, um, but you can catch that video and all the previous ones at falkirtvineyard.com forward slash kids. Um, and see the, the videos there. So, for, and I'm always saying, well done, Rachel and yeah. the team uh, for some fantastic stuff um, that you've been doing on those videos all through lockdown. Great, great job, yeah, great job, <laughs> great job. Also, um, I just want uh, just, to just to uh, remind you that uh, every Wednesday, um, Love Falkirk, which is our, our compassion ministry in, in Falkirk Vineyard, we have our food pantry running at Camlin Juniors Football Club. And uh, I just mentioned it today so that you would continue to pray uh, for the team there and uh, for the people that we're supporting. Um, we, we have got a mixture um, of, of people who, who come along and are supported by the food pantry. But we have a few guys there in particular who are really struggling just now, struggling with health and addiction and just other life stuff. Um, and would you just take a moment every day just to pray First of all, for the team, for the volunteers at, at Love Falkirk, um, but also um, for our friends, who, our, our, our congregation, our community that come along every Wednesday, some of which are in great, great need, and we need to see God move in their lives. Um, yeah, so if you could pray for those guys, that would be amazing. Right. Now we're on to our favourite part <laughs> of the service. We're going to jump over to Zoom and you can get that by, well, there'll be a wee box that you can just click on on the live chat and that will take you to the Zoom call. If you're watching on Facebook Live or on YouTube, then you'll need to jump over to the online platform where our community meet and then you can get the Zoom link there. But we, Andrew and I and our team would love to come and pray with you, pray over you and hear what God's got to say. So why don't you do that right now? See you on the other side on Zoom. 